If the goal of life is to get as rich as possible, there are certain rules that make sense. Don't pay your house off. Maximize uh, Real estate rentals were a business back in 2010, 11, 12. It is not a business anymore. There's no room for mediocrity in real estate anymore. Either you're great or you're out. What do you see as the thing right now? Like what's well, working? My plan now, we're going all in on this. What up, Wealth Builders? Today, this man just happened to walk into my office and I'm like, well, dude, we got to do another podcast because everyone loves this guy. He is the owner and founder of Open Door Capital, where they're managing over a billion dollars of real estate assets. He is the former host of the Bigger Pockets podcast, now the host of the Better Life podcast, which we had a great episode on uh, recently. And I've got none other than my good buddy, Brandon Turner. What's up? What's up, man? Thanks for having me back. Yeah, dude. I feel like we were just here. We were. Last time though, I was in short shorts. Yeah. And so this time I, I brought jeans. I not only did I bring jeans, I brought your jeans. Oh, these are, those are my jeans. These baby. are your jeans, dude. I said this before. And I'll say it again. These are the best jeans I have ever owned. And I'm not paid to say that. Yeah. Like, I legit wear these. That's the only jeans I wear now. I'm going to have so, them get you a couple other pairs. So, <laughs> no, I'm going to get you some I don't other take colors these off. I and everything. Them, I, li- no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, I take showers in them. They're pajamas. They're, they're, everything. they're everything. No, but these are the most comfortable jeans of all time. So good job. Dude, thank you. But, I tried yeah. to tell people, I'm like, look, they're AI. Like yeah. they'll, because there's no sizing. Yeah. It just, it you comes it the way you want it. Yeah. It's perfect. So thank yeah. you. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. Shout out to scene. Yeah. My partner on the jeans. They're killing it. Yeah. So we'll link to them down below. But uh, dude, so, you know, last time you were here, this was a few months ago yeah. and we did wealth con. You absolutely crushed it. Everybody mm, was excited thanks. to see you because you were out of your hiding. <laughs> I think you hadn't spoken at events in a long I time. I had not spoken in a long time. Yeah. I don't really like speak anymore. Yeah. And so I think, you know, we had a massive turnout because people were like, dude, this might be the only time Brandon ever speaks again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm beginning to shift my thought on that. And, and I'd love to p- pick your brain on that. You know, like, I mean, speaking's good, helps you raise money and all that, but it's also like leaving family and disruption. How do you, how do you deal with that? I'm turning the interview back on you. How do you deal with um, the, those I, events? Well, I just don't speak that much like okay. for other people's stuff. Yeah. So I would say maybe a couple times a year. I yeah. speak for other because I speak so much for my own stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But you know, for me, we run a lot of events, but they're all in Vegas. Yeah. So it's just like a normal day for me. I'm like, oh yeah, you know, today I just happened to be holding a workshop yeah. or yeah, wealth cons today and I'm gonna go sleep at home. Yeah. Dude, yeah, that sounds be, there are a lot of benefits to living in Maui. Like Maui's great, it's beautiful, but man, like nobody wants to come. I mean, nobody comes there for like we had a conference. You, you can't and, hold a conference yeah, there every quarter. Yeah, you can't hold a conference every quarter. We can't <laughs> once hold a year meetings. Like it's it's hard. So you yeah, boo hoo. I get the beaches and I just yeah, have to travel dude. six hours for everything. You think you're gonna keep living there? Uh, you know, I feel like nobody lives there forever unless you were born there. Yeah, but uh, I think once you make it through the one year mark, yeah, uh, Maui and Hawaii has a way of like chewing people up and spitting them out yeah and so we lasted through the one year and now we're there five years so now i think i'm there at least till the kids are older yeah how has it been with the fire yeah man the fires were wild uh man yeah i haven't been here since the fire so yeah, yeah. the fires were it was insane like i mean in, in so many ways uh maui gets fires yeah that was it's very dry yeah it's very dry that. yeah exactly yeah it's not you people think jungle and all that like, it's not <laughs> yeah maui is very dry i live in a literal desert yeah like we get three or two and a half a desert with an ocean year. yeah a desert with the ocean so i'm on de- we have cactus in my neighborhood <laughs> uh yeah like it it feels like a desert we just water our lawn with a thousand dollars a month water bill so it's like <laughs> it looks really nice uh but uh, yeah, Maui so gets fires all the time, and and there was this fog. Uh, what, like, well, they call in the industry fog of war in, in military. They call it like the fog of war. It's like you don't know what's going on when you get in, into war. Like you go into a battle, they don't you don't know what's going on. You don't have any information, so everything's just hard to comprehend and hard to figure out. So like I have friends that live in Lahaina where the fires went down. Like they live in Lahaina and they did not know that their town burned down. Yeah. A quarter mile away. They didn't know that their town was gone. That's crazy. It's crazy. Cause you just, when cell phones are gone, this is actually probably the biggest lesson from this thing. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of lessons, but what do you do when cell phones drop? Like, people like it life is so hard like and we don't remember what that was like and like you couldn't communicate with people that were 10 minutes away yeah um you couldn't get through because the road was closed i mean it was just chaos and no one knew what was going on nobody was stepping up like you know because nobody knew it was nobody was in charge there was no one that's like okay guys this is what we do in a fire just pure chaos and uh and lahaina is like gone 
Lahaina is gone. Like the main, like the downtown, like the old part to the ground. It's just completely gone. That's crazy. It's it, absolutely insane. Now on like I'm, uh, roughly a hundred people died, but that's way better than the thousand that we were expecting. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of really bad coincidences and things that happened that led to a lot of conspiracy theories. And then a lot of really good things that have happened that led to a lot of lives being saved. And so it's kind of a little bit of both and just, nobody will hear about that. No, no, nobody's hearing about that. You're gonna hear about Oprah firing space beams from a satellite <laughs> to buy land or something like this. It was crazy stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Oof. Well, anyway. Yeah. yeah. That's crazy, man. Cause I, uh, I've been to Lahaina every time I go to Maui and yeah. it's like, I, you know, eating there yeah. and, and it's just gone. Dude, I keep doing these things where like, this happens when people pass away too, where you're like, you're like, oh, I got to make sure I go tell that person, oh wait, they're not here. So I do that all the time. I'm like, oh, I got to go pick up a kite from that kite store that doesn't exist anymore. And I'll be like, oh, I, I can't wait to try that burger again at Cool Cat Cafe that doesn't exist anymore. Like that keeps happening Yeah, uh, where I just think of something I got to go do in Lahaina. And I'm like, wait, that doesn't exist. Like it's yeah. gone. It's crazy. And it's, uh, you know, it'll be a decade, I think, before we see like a thriving town there again. It's like, it's not going to be fixed overnight or over, in the, over wow. the year or two. Yeah. A decade. That's yeah. insane. So yeah, I mean, dude, it's, uh, it's wild. Um, obviously like when we're talking about like the town being destroyed, a lot of that, well, I mean, the majority of that is real estate, right? Yeah. It's like, uh -huh. you know, everything kind of always goes back to real estate of like, man, dude, you know, the ground is still there, Yeah. but now we got to put new buildings on yep. it. And, yeah. and that gets complicated because what do you put there? And like, how do you make people happy? You don't like, yeah, it just, yeah, it's going to be tough. It's going to be and tough. And then like, you know, people are going to be building around like rubble yep. and ashes. And yeah. So the first six months are so supposed to be all for cleanup, six months to a year. And the federal government's going to take care of that. But then it's like, what do people do in the meantime? I mean, Vegas is going to grow from all the people leaving Maui. Probably like, that's where people go when they leave Maui is they go to Vegas. Yep. Um, it's, it's sad. And then it, yeah, it's just, yeah, what do you do? Like it's it's so over. They, they built a hundred houses in Maui a year, and now we have two thousand to build. It's like, how do you even comprehend that scale? Where are you going to get all the workers? Where are you going to get the workers? Materials? Where are you going to house the workers? Where are you going? Like, there's all these problems, and no one knows what to do. <laughs> so yeah, it's nobody's, like nobody's creating like a yeah a plan. Yeah, we started a foundation actually when it happened. Like me and like five, six other like real estate minded people on the island that are all business and real estate guys, we got together and we're like, how do we help? Like we've got expertise. We've got some ability to raise money. What do we do? So we started a foundation. It's called the Mackay Foundation. And to be honest, like even when we were raising money, we were just like half a million bucks, uh, a lot of through my Instagram, but we didn't even have a real clear answer on what we do with the money because it comes in such weird phases. Like in the beginning, people just needed food. Yeah. And then it was like, they need generators. And now it's like, they need jobs. And then later on, it's going to be, they need houses. So, uh, we're trying to figure out like, how do we use a bunch of like the, the biggest developer in Maui? And then like me being like, I don't know, the loudest famous <laughs> real, estate real estate. Guy. Yeah. The, the, the loud, like loud. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Most I, I don't, known. Yes. I don't know. Like what, what do we do? So yeah, we got, we got some plans in place that we're working toward, but, um, I like the idea of thinking, like we want to keep uh, generational lands in generational hands. Okay. So we don't want just, I mean, I, I'm a real estate investor like everyone else, but we yeah. don't want real estate investors coming and offering, you know, pennies on the dollar to this, this land that's super valuable, but people are desperate yeah. to sell because they just, they're, they're out of money and they have to still pay their mortgage payment. And like, there's a lot of like, yeah, there's a lot of mess there. So hopefully we can kind of help uh, yeah. the people behind a rebuild. No, I mean, it's a long road. It's that's long for road. sure. But uh, no, it's good to hear that. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like subsided yeah. and it wasn't as bad yeah. as people predicted. So that's good to know. Yeah. You know, a couple of good lessons to pull out from a real estate standpoint, people listening to real estate investors is, especially if you're in a condo, I mean, really it's everybody review your insurance. Nobody thinks about insurance that much unless they need it. And what people are finding in Lahaina now is that nobody had enough insurance because property values have gone up so much over the last five years. They didn't insure them enough. They didn't insure them enough. So people have, a, they, they don't like they're out. They just like, they may have been enough, maybe had enough insurance to cover their mortgage, you know, like whatever they owed. Yeah. And that's what a lot I mean, And now and they I just think, have land. And now they just have land and, and, yeah, they can pay off their mortgage. Maybe what are they like, what are they going to do? And so maybe they can finance again. They're like, there's some people will be fine. A lot of people had no insurance. A lot of, uh, people were severely underinsured. Uh, it's, it's a real mess. So one thing that's taught me is like really review my insurance. Cause yeah, my properties are probably worth double what they were three years ago. Yeah. Did I double my insurance? I bet I didn't. And I bet <laughs> most people listening didn't. Yeah. So it's a good lesson for us is, uh, Keep in touch on that. Everyone knows that my favorite way to build wealth is through real estate investing. That's the reason that I started Wealthy Investor, where we've trained thousands of students. But here's the thing. 
I've noticed that so many people fail to get started in real estate because they're worried about the money. They don't know where they're going to get the money to buy a house or flip or handle their renovations and things like that. And so they just never get started. I want to change that. And that's why I created a brand new free course that goes over five different ways that you could buy houses without using any of your own money today. And I'm going to give you it completely for free. All you have to do is go to wealthyinvestor.com slash podcast. I've made it specifically for you. The moment you go to that link, you'll be able to go get access to it and learn how you can start buying houses today without any of your own money. And if you're somebody who already has a real estate business and who wants to scale, we want to help you too. You can click the link below and book a free strategy call with our team if that's you. Speaking of that, lessons. Um, You know, last, last podcast, we talked a lot about, you know, funds yeah. and syndications and you know you're talking about how you're 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 living on like 80 <laughs> 80 grand a month and you know like not making money and uh that sounds I, a lot of that by the way <laughs> yeah i know exactly so <laughs> i'm thinking man back to just how real estate has evolved yeah over the years right because you were the first guy a lot of people um who are our age started listening to on you know bigger pockets back over a decade ago yeah and it's funny because we're just in such a different environment today than yeah. we were back then. And before we we got filming, we were just laughing about like old things yeah. that, you know, were standards yeah. and rules that, uh, you know, you were talking about 10 years ago. Yeah. Like, like don't buy a deal less than the 2% rule. Yeah. What is the 2% rule for those who don't know? Cause that's <laughs> yeah. not a thing. Yeah. The 2% rule was you should only buy a property. This was preached high and low. You should only buy a property that you can rent for 2% of what you buy it for. So if it's a hundred thousand dollar property, you should be able to rent it for $2,000 a month. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, a $200,000 property, you should be able to rent for $4,000 a month. Yeah. And it's like, that just doesn't exist. And what's interesting over the last decade is to watch that. It was everyone's like the 2% rule. And then it was like one and a half percent is pretty good. And then it's like 1%. Not today. It's like, if you can get half a percent, yeah. you're like, you're doing okay. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, cash flow has changed. And those, I mean, those deals just, pr- they printed money back then. Yeah. Like it, they, but you couldn't finance them. There was like, the loans were terrible. Like, like nobody was lending back in 2010. Yep, yep. It was really hard to get loans. So things tend to shift between the financing and the opportunities. Today, we have both those uh, struggles, right? We, it's hard to get loans today because interest rates are so high. Yep. And today it's really hard to find properties. And so yeah. every, it's just, it's a harder, it's a different world. Yeah. There's always something that's hard about real estate. Like, yeah. People, people are like, man, I wish it was 2010 again. Yeah. And then like when I was, you know, I got started in 2010. It's like, well, dude, getting a loan was really difficult. No one yeah. had money. The economy was awful. Yep. Like, and we didn't know if it was c- going to get better. We didn't like hindsight's twenty twenty. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it, yes, you could make a guess, and we we did. We bought property. We assumed things would get better. Yeah. But there was a fear that nobody talked a about. A lot the fear. of fear. There's so much fear that we were going to go into a double dip. Like people like Kiyosaki were like, "No, the end's coming." Like, <laughs> get your Robert. guns. Yeah. <laughs> Him and Michael Berry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Everything They're was always, yeah, it's, it, it's broken clock twice a day. Right. It's correct. Yeah. It's like, uh, <laughs> it's, it's like, I've never heard that. Yeah. It's, it's like <laughs> yeah, every, yeah, a broken clock <laughs> twice is right a day twice is a day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so like, you just keep preaching it, but there was so much fear that the world was going to collapse. But you look at the numbers and you're like, I mean, it's a 2% deal. Like it, it yeah. cash flow is a thousand dollars a month. Like well, we should be okay. My, my thing was, I just got started, you know, 2010 was when I got licensed. I was 21 years old. So I was like, maybe they're right. Like, I don't, it I know, seems, yeah. it, it, to me, I'm like looking at it and I'm saying, I don't know how you lose buying this. Yep. Like it just, it's so cheap. It's dropped like 80% of what it just sold for. Yep. The rent would easily cover the mortgage. I'm not sure why you wouldn't buy this, but that was my thinking. And then people are like, oh, you don't get it, dude. You're young. Yeah. It's going to drop. And- yeah. Yeah. There was so much fear. It's like I said the word earlier, fog of war, but that's what it is always in real estate. There's always a fog of war. You cannot see what the enemy's doing. You can't see what the economy is doing. You don't know what the market's going to do tomorrow. Like, you don't know what it's doing in other areas. You don't know what people are buying for necessarily. Like it's just, it's, it's messy all the time. Yeah. There is no great time to get into real estate. Like there's no great time where it's like, oh, it's everything's perfect. Now looking back, 2021 one was a pretty good time to flip houses or 2020. Yeah. But in that moment, we all thought a recession was coming like yeah. that day. Like, well, let's, let's, let's actually like give a history yeah. of um, real estate the last just, I guess, 15 years. Right. Yeah. So we, we started at, Hey, it crashed. Yep. 2008 crashed. Everyone's super scared. Yeah. Right. 2010. Which made everyone then go, we have to buy cash flow. 
Because you learn, you always learn from the lessons previously, right? So what were the lessons learned in 05, 06, 07? Mm -hmm. Was those guys where cash flow didn't matter. You buy because properties were going to double in value. Yeah. And uh, anyone can get a loan. Anyone can get a loan and you don't need good loans. You just got to get a you loan. Know, yeah, just a loan. Own the property. Yeah. So like those were what we did. That led to the collab. So then we learned from that. And we said, okay, cash flow only. Don't ever care about appreciation. Uh, only get fixed rate. Ultra dead. safe. Yeah. Ultra safe. Like we all overreacted, maybe not overreacted. We all reacted that way and that worked. And then, and you know, changed. From, from 2010, 11, 12, you know, that that's kind of like what people were saying. Yep. And I remember here in Vegas anyways, right. We got hit harder than anyone. So yeah. I remember when I got licensed in 2010, you know, inventory, dude, people complain about just how much inventory is available at just all different points. In that time, there was like 10 months of inventory yeah. in Vegas and over 90% was owned by the banks. Jeez, so yeah. imagine like you're a realtor, nobody can get a loan. So you can't really sell houses yep. to anyone. And then there's no listings to get. They're all owned by the banks. Yep. Somebody's already, you know, listing them all. And I just remember being a realtor back then. I'm like, dude, real estate's really hard. Why do people do this? <laughs> <laughs> like, I was like, I don't want to be a realtor at all. This yeah. is terrible. Um, and then the commissions were super low because the prices were super yep. low. So everything about it was terrible yep. as a realtor. And I remember around 2012, you know, prices started to come up, but then we had a new problem here in Vegas. Anyways, they passed some law. I remember this 10 years ago, realtors in Vegas. If you're watching, you'll remember too, if you were around, um, that the banks could no longer foreclose that they needed proper paperwork. And I'm pretty sure this was actually nationwide because what was happening was there were so many foreclosures and the banks were just ripping them instantly. And they said, no, 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 no. You guys are the ones who gave these bad loans. You need to, you know, have the burden of proof that, yeah. you know, you're not at fault for why these people are in foreclosure. And so they like foreclosures came to a halt around that time. And so what happened was these people were still way underwater. They just could not get foreclosed on. And so there began this short sale boom, yeah. which once again was terrible as a realtor, because if you found a, a good house, uh, crap, now we got to go do a short sale. If you yep. don't know what that is, it's when you owe more on the mortgage than it's worth. And so it takes forever because you have to go submit this crap to the bank, negotiate, hope they accept way less than what's owed. It was just this whole nightmare, yeah. dude. I don't know if you went through that. I, you know, I did a little bit of that for sure. Uh, about a few short sales back in the day. But what, what I think is funny as you're even just telling the story about like the, the movements is like there are these movements where certain things are just the thing. Yeah. So I know guys that in that foreclosure time, like when foreclosures were going crazy, just cleaned up. I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of foreclosures they bought and just yeah. made a ton of money. And then that ended and some of them lost all their stuff and some of them pivoted. And then there was a short sale period. Yeah. And then there was a period where rentals made a lot of sense. And then flipping back, you know, over the last four years, flipping been really good. And so there's this, but then all of a sudden it will stop. It can stop quickly too. Yeah. And so as a real estate investor, it is our job to constantly be monitoring, monitoring the market and saying, what is the thing now? And what do I have to be careful of and pivot to? Because if you're still doing the thing that you were doing five years ago, yeah, you're going to get caught with your pants down and you're going to be in trouble. And so you have to constantly constantly be shifting, but you also don't want to be shifty, right? You don't want to be the guy that's like jumping from thing to thing to thing. Cause you just suck. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that, it's like, <laughs> because that's what most people do. Yeah. So what is the thing right now? I mean, what do you, what do you see as the thing right now? Like what's well, working? I'm going to make people stay to the end and okay. tell them what's working Ooh, okay, now. I like that. So we're going to use a little, uh, creator, you know, logic <laughs> so we can get our watch time up. Oh, look at this. But, but I think we should just, you know, like walk through the history. So it's like, yeah, I remember that short sale period. It was crazy. And I yeah. bought short sales back then too, because it was literally like in Vegas, anyways, that was the majority of the market. Yeah. And, you know, for those wondering, like it usually takes, say, 30 days to close a property. A short sale could take a year. Yep. So it's terrible if you're an agent yep. or somebody trying to buy. You don't yep. know when it's going to happen. Um, and what was crazy about that period was that the banks were so needy to unload them that they were offering short sale incentives. So these people who literally hadn't paid their mortgage in years, the bank was saying, hey, I'll give you $20,000, $10,000, $30,000 to start the short sale process now. They were bonusing <laughs> them for not paying. It was crazy. Oh, such wild times. Dude, it was crazy. Let me, let me know in the comments if any of you remember that because yeah. I was like, 
wait a minute, this doesn't make, why, why would this, <laughs> this yeah. guy gets rewarded for not paying his bills? But hey, for the bank, it was like, dude, if we don't, we're never going to get this property back. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was wild. Crazy times. And so, then, I, yeah. Well, I was going to say like the, uh, the acquisition strategies changed then too, right? Because I all would buy is foreclosures back then. Yeah. But, so it went from foreclosures yep, only yep. to then short sales. Yep. And then when I started watching you on yep. Bigger Pockets, it was in 2014, 2015. Yep. And at that point, then the market had normalized. There yep. was like, uh, people had equity in their homes again. Yep. You know, there was normal sellers. There were still foreclosures. There, it was like a very just normal market. Yep. And that was when I started listening to you guys. And at that point, I'd been a realtor for five years but not a flipper or a landlord or anything. And I'm like, dude, I need to invest in real estate. Freaking, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And then that was when I started hearing about the concepts you were talking about, like the 2% rule. <laughs> and, but even at that point in 2015 in yep. Vegas, I was looking at it, which by the way, prices were still ultra cheap in 2015 compared to where they are today. And I would look at like a hundred thousand dollar home because they still existed and they were still only renting for like 1200, 1300. And I'm like, that doesn't fit the 2% rule. Yeah, yeah. I'll never, yeah. I'll never own a rental here. <laughs> yeah. And I've been preaching that from the beginning. It was like the 2% rule was a, it's more of a guideline, right? It was like more of like a, it, it was a good quick and dirty way to say, Hey, does this make sense? So even like the 1% rule, I still like the 1% rule today. If I'm going to go in the right look, market in the right market. Yeah. But yeah. it changes drastically depending on taxes and insurance and other things like mm. 1% rule in Texas is very different than 1% rule in Nevada. Cause, cause Texas is taxes are tax, stupid. Tax, yeah. Texas is super high. And so you might be paying $800 a month for your house in Texas for taxes. You know, a, a $200,000 house in Texas taxes are higher than my $3 million house in Hawaii. It's just like, really? Tax are super cheap in Hawaii. Like I didn't super know that. cheap. Yeah, super cheap. Um, I think I pay $2,000 a year for my house. It's worth three and a half million. Uh, what's, what's your mortgage? Uh, let's see. I bought it at 1.7 five years ago. It's worth about three, five today. My mortgage, I put down 500 grand. So I think my mortgage was at like one, two. I'm probably down to one, one. Uh, okay. uh, and at interest rate wise, I think I'm at three, two. Or something oh, okay. Like that. So your mortgage is cheap. My mortgage is not bad. Yeah. I think my whole mortgage, I don't know what it is. I don't even know what it is. 1700 like maybe. Or, or, yeah. Well, I should say I have two mortgages. 6, I have two because I have a, I have a second and I have a first on it. So the, oh. the second is like 17 and the other one's like 49 maybe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I did like a, it was like a 10. Okay. So you, what's your total? 20 something loan. What's your total? Total payment all together. Well, between what you, you, cause you did a second. Yeah. Yeah. All combined together. It's like seven grand a month. I think is what I'm at. I'm if I'm remembering right. I thought you uh, said 17 just now. It was 17 for the first, for the second mortgage. And it's like f basically five. 17,000 or 1700? 1, 1700 a month. Oh. And then it's 5,000 ish, give or take a little bit on the first mortgage. I'm surprised you don't take out a bigger second. Uh, I definitely could. Um, I just, I don't know why, I, I don't know why I haven't, I like the idea of paying my primary off. If it doesn't make you any still got a little sense, Dave Ramsey, in a you. little bit of Dave Ramsey in me. Actually, what made the biggest difference was a book called life in air. Have you heard of that one? No, it's called life in air. And he makes this great point in there. And I don't believe every, I'm not a Dave Ramsey, uh, debt, you know, person necessarily. Uh, but he makes this really good point. Here's the point of life in air is he says, Hey, if the point of life is to make millions of dollars. You're going to play by certain rules. If the game of Monopoly, if the goal of Monopoly is to wipe out everyone else and be the only one left, you play by certain ways. If the goal of Monopoly was actually to avoid any properties, you would play a different way. If yeah. the goal of Monopoly was to go around the board as many times as possible, you would play a different way. So the rule of like the goal of the game de determines how you play the game, right? That makes sense. Yeah. If the goal of life is to get as rich as possible, there are certain rules that make sense. Yeah. Don't pay your house off. Yep maximize as much as you possibly can uh, leverage everything you can, right? If the goal of life is to get as rich as possible, but you and I both know the goal of life is not to get as rich as possible. Wealth is great. Yeah. It's not the goal of my life. There are other goals of life that are more important than wealth. And so when I look at, so they make this point in the book is when you pay your house off, like that is a rule that doesn't make sense mathematically, but it might support a more important rule or goal of life. Maybe like making your spouse feel just comfortable. Yeah. yeah. Now I would argue that having a paid off house is actually way riskier than having a loan on it. Right. Cause then you're going to get sued and uh, you get lose. You have just so much money, but there's ways to prevent against that. There's, there's things. Yeah. So anyway, all, all that said, I have a lot of room in my house yeah. uh, because I do want to pay that off. Yeah. And then I will go get a, like one of the strategies, right? You go get a massive second mortgage on it, line of credit, and then you just don't use it. Yeah. So yeah. when some people go look at it, they're like, Oh, you have massive amounts of debt on this property. We're not, it's not worth suing you. 
Uh, and in reality, you don't and have to do that. And if you do get sued, it. then you do go max Then you go max it out at that point. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah so there, there's sense. games you can play there. There's games you can play. <laughs> <laughs> if you're watching this show, my guess is you're probably an entrepreneur who's trying to grow your business. And for me, the best thing I ever did to grow my business was build my personal brand on social media. It's allowed me to get more revenue. It's allowed me to raise more capital and it's allowed me to hire better talent. And if you are not currently creating content for your brand, you're missing out and your competition is. So if you want to learn to grow, my advice is to create a podcast. Now there's a lot that goes into building a podcast and why I believe it's the best way. So I've actually created a free training that I want you to go check out. If you go to panadamedia.com slash podcast, you can go access the free training right now and see how a podcast is going to be the best decision to grow your personal brand today. So go check it out by clicking the link below and I'll see you in the training. Yeah, I think uh, it's interesting because, I, you know, I, I mean, who knows? Maybe one day I'll change where I'm like, oh, you know what? Yeah, I want a paid off house. I haven't ever yeah. desired that. Um, yeah, and I'm not working toward it. I mean, I'm not yeah. putting any money towards it, but <laughs> uh, I just, in my head, I'm like, that would be cool. I think that would be cool. And then I probably would get a line of credit. I use it to burr properties or something like that. But you know, you want to know why, like, I, it doesn't really matter to me because I don't really care about my house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I'm like, if I did lose it, just get whatever. It yeah. Yeah. We like, I out. just don't care. Like yeah. I'll, I'll get another house. Yeah. And then I know at some point I'll replace it. Yeah. You know, one thing that might surprise a lot of people about my house in Hawaii, that $7,000 a month probably sounds like a lot to people. Um, I rent out my back house for 3000 a month. I have a, a separate house an ADU. Yeah. I rent out for 3000 a month. That takes my whole mortgage down to right around four. Let's call it. Yeah. I also have the downstairs area at my house, which is another unit that I don't rent out right now, but I could rent it out for three or maybe even four as well. Uh, I only live on the top floor. So if I wanted to, I could live for free in a three and a half million dollar house like yeah. in Hawaii. Uh, so I think when I talk about house hacking a lot, it's like a popular strategy that, that worked in 2008, 10, 12, 15, 18, works in 2023. Yeah, House hacking has been uh, a big piece of my journey and I'm still doing it today, uh, even in a multi-million dollar property. Mm. Uh, I think that's just like, I, I like to tell people that because I think there are there's a, a lot of people who, especially maybe their spouse is like, oh, I ain't ever going to live with a tenant. Like, I don't want to live in a crappy duplex over in the crap part of town. Like, I'm yeah. not going to do that. But I'm like, there are ways to house hack. Um, and not that I needed to either. Uh, I just like the idea of saying, hey, worst case scenario, I could move out of Hawaii, good. rent out all three units, and now I don't have to worry about it. It just takes all, like not all, but it takes a monster amount of the risk off the table that I always have those options available. And real estate, like, it's not always like, Sometimes real estate's about who survives the longest yeah. uh, in a lot of ways. Well, that's business. Yeah, in business. Yeah, it's not always like growth is important, but like, can you survive? Uh, David Green, Bigger Pockets uh, podcast, David Green says, cash flow is a defensive metric. And I love that concept. Like we buy properties at cash flow so we can hold on to them long enough to actually make wealth. Like, I don't know any billionaires who are like, yeah, I did it through cash flow. Like, that's not <laughs> I got like, rich on my yeah, cash flow. Yeah, don't always get rich off cash flow. Yeah. Like, you I, get rich off properties and you can only the hold appreciation. Them. Yeah, appreciation. Yep. Yep. I tell people that all the time. Yep. I'm like, that, bro, you ain't making no money with your cash. Yeah, flow. no, yeah. <laughs> like, freaking, you ain't getting rich. <laughs> yeah, it's, you're really not. Now, maybe if you're in the business of cash flow, like Airbnbs or assisted living. It's not even cash yeah. flow. That's yeah, just that's business. business. <laughs> exactly. Then it's just business. <laughs> yeah. Which is where I think to go back to the conversation about like what's shifted over the years, today I think uh, largely like I'm seeing like, yeah, there's not a lot of cash flow in rentals. Well, well and I, I just don't see too, it. Yeah, you for sure don't see it. It's it's non-existent. Yeah. But uh it goes back to like, okay, in 2015, when I got started, right? Everybody was like, bro, cash flow, cash flow, yeah. cash flow, buy these rentals. And flipping was kind of looked down upon, at least from me looking from the outside at bigger pockets, because people are like, bro, yeah. you don't want to flip for a Yeah, game. you got to pay taxes on that. You got to play you capital that? gains. <laughs> yeah. You don't have ownership. And I'm like, Dude, I don't know, man, because I, I I could really use twenty five thousand yeah, exactly. right now. Like that seems way better than two hundred bucks. Oh, so yeah, so much better. <laughs> and so I was like, I'm just gonna, I, I don't know about that one. And but so then, I just went flipping. But the downside of flipping, of course, then you got to go back to the well and get more water every time you're yeah. thirsty, right? You're not building your own but, pipeline, but so once again, welcome to running a business. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's like it's okay. Like <laughs> that's the funny thing about about financial freedom in general is like. We work so hard to get financial freedom so I can not pay my bills. But then like, what do you do with your time? You just, what, you're going to sit and watch TV or scroll TikTok all day? No, you're going to go out and <laughs> work and work do something again. anyway. So maybe, maybe instead of 
focusing so much on cash flow, financial freedom, we could focus a little bit more on just building a life you don't have to escape from. Yeah. Right. Like that idea of like, I just, I like what I do every single day. So if that's flipping houses, flip houses, if it's wholesale and wholesale, if you want to own an ice cream shop, own an ice cream shop. Yeah. Well, I think for me in my situation was, and I, I believe this for every beginner, it's like, okay, well, most beginners don't have money. Yeah. You should not buy rentals. Yeah. You're broke. Yeah. <laughs> like it's yeah. not going to do anything. Yep. Like what, what's your main goal? Okay. If you're, you got a W2 that you like and you make money. Okay. I don't mind you buying rentals and yep. like buy one this mo- year and whatever. But if you're broke, broke yeah. how are, how is a rental doing anything for you? Yeah. Yeah. That $200 a month that you get, it's not getting you anywhere. Well, and also you're one repair away from also like losing it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. (laughs) Like what's more risky owning the rental that pays you 200 bucks a month while you're still broke Yeah. or trying to flip that property and making 30 grand. Yeah. You know, and people who have a W2 job too, I I would argue it like people are trying to make 200 bucks a month off a rental house that they have to put all this time and effort into when they should be going to their boss and asking for a raise for a thousand dollars a month raise. Yeah, you know, <laughs> That'd be get, way easier. Like, it'd be way easier. Just like go, <laughs> go gain a skill set, take a class for a week, gain some skill set, get good at that thing, your job, go to your boss and get a raise for a thousand dollars a month. And you just got yourself five rental properties. Yeah. Like with no money I, down. I was talking to a guy who used to be at my former brokerage, my real estate brokerage. And, um, he was like, Ryan, dude, I'm trying to get to 20 K a month cash flow. And I go, here we go. You know, like in my mind, whenever I hear this, I'm just like, all right, let's hear it. And he's like, you know, uh, what should I invest in? Should I go to the Midwest? I don't know. It's hard to make cash flow in Vegas. And I go, let's just walk through the math. So, okay. Let's just say somehow in the Midwest, you're like getting 500 bucks a month. Yep. Cool. So we need 20 or no, we need 40. Yeah, we need 40, 40 of those, them. Yep. How are you going to buy 40? Yeah. Like, where are you going to find 40 deals? Number one, yep. how are you going to get the down payments? What, what's your plan there? Oh, well, I don't know, but I'm just looking to get that first. I'm like, the, f- the plan already doesn't work. Yeah. Like, you can't <laughs> even do it. Even if, even if you pick the market that you want to attack, you can't even do the things you need to do. Yep. You, you can't find enough deals. You don't have enough capital. What's the plan then? He's like, oh, well, that's why I'm talking to you. What should I do? <laughs> and I'm like, well, I'll tell you what you should do. Don't try to buy a rental. Yeah. Figure out how to make 20 grand a month with a skill. That's way easier. Yeah, it really is. It's it's so much easier. Now, that said, we all still love real estate because yeah. long term, you're gonna build wealth through owning real estate. Yeah, yeah. Like so there's a there's a there's a a balance there. So I I've been driving people more and more. I'm like, make money at your job, get a raise, be the best employee you can be, start a business, flip houses, do something like be so good that you can make half a million to a million a year in income from your job, career, business, whatever. Then go ahead and take that and start buying real estate yeah. or investing in funds or whatever. Yeah. And I told him, I go, dude, like just flip houses wholesale. You were with me five years ago. You saw what yeah. happened. Like you didn't think that maybe you should try and get on that train a little bit, Yeah, you know, and he, he's done well for himself. And, you know, 20 years of being a realtor, he's like, yeah, you know, like I have a million bucks of equity, yeah. you know, in my stuff. And I go, okay. And how'd you do that? Well, you know, I, I did house hacks. He's like, you know, I bought a house and. You know, I sat on it and fixed yeah. it up. And then I, I got another house and moved into that. And then I moved into the next yeah. house. And he's like, now I have, you know, this portfolio and all that. And I go, okay, so that's amazing. I'm not discounting that. That's great. But you still never learned a skill. Yeah. Like you still haven't figured out how to actually make money. You just, like you said, bought yep. real estate. You got appreciation, not cash yep. flow. Yep. Yes. And it, that's, yeah. that's how it should work. But here's the problem. You still like, if you want to go continue, it's going to take the exact same amount of time. Like you, it's going to be another 15 years yeah. to go do that again. Yeah, it really is. It's, um, again, it's great to buy it, hold on to it, have it, but somehow we real estate, real estate. And this maybe is a good summary. I've never really thought this, but I'm, I'm going to say this, like real estate rentals were a business back in 20. 10, 11, 12. In other words, they were a for-profit business. Cash it flow, worked. It like was a the cash, cash flow, flow yeah. the income. Yep. It yeah. was actually a business. It is not a business anymore. Mm-hmm. It is now an, inv- it's back to what it was in five, six, seven, which is an investment. Yeah. You buy it, you hold it for a long time. Nobody buys Tesla stock and assumes that they're going to get financial freedom off it in the next two years. No, yeah. you buy Tesla because 20 years from now, it's going to be worth a lot more. Yeah. Um, and so real estate has shifted back 
rental single family rentals and small multifamily rentals have shifted back from business to investment. Yeah. And it, it still is a phenomenal investment all yeah, day long. hundred percent. It's just not going to get you out of your job next year. Yeah. It's not your cash flow financial yeah. freedom that it's been pitched for the last decade. Yeah. Now that said, I think there are avenues, things like if you were going to go out there and hustle, and again, let's go back to the business, <laughs> right? You're going to go hustle your way into a small apartment complex or a mobile home park. Let's you buy a 40 unit mobile home park that's been mismanaged for years. You go in there and you just work it and you work it hard and you get it turned around and you get it fixed up and you get bad tenants out, new ones in. There could be life-changing financial freedom cash flow in that. But it's, it's still not an investment. You had to do all that. Like you own this. Business you own this of business. The mobile home yeah, park. mobile home park is a great business. Uh, yeah. Assisted living, great business. Uh, Airbnb, great business. Yeah, business. Business. Yes. Yeah. It's it's to me, it's no different than any other business that operates yep. right here in this building. Yep. Like it's just it's a business. Yeah. And you're like, but you own real estate, and I'm like, I could own this building too that I run my business out of. Like yep. they're just businesses. They're just businesses. Yeah. And once you under the, the beauty of that though is once you understand business, it tra it's a universal language. It translates to everything. So like you could go and start right now an ice cream shop and you'd kill it. Oh yeah. Like you'd kill it because you know how to run a business. Yeah. Uh, and the funny thing is most people, real estate investors don't read business books. They just read real estate books, especially when they're getting into it. All you yeah. want to really real estate, real estate, real estate. They're reading all these stupid Brandon Turner books. I know. Why stop reading my books and go read like <laughs> go read traction from go read some real books. or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Read a real book. Go read your next five moves. Patrick Bed David. Something that's like. Hey, by the way, how many oh, books have you sold over the years? I don't know. A couple million, I think. I don't, yeah, I was going to say you look, have to yeah. be millions. Yeah, it's a couple million at least. But that's crazy. It's wild. <laughs> it, w when I left the podcast, that how went off a cliff. But <laughs> yeah, but at this point, how much could you get in a book advance? Do you think? I have no idea. Uh, I've never got a book advance because all the bigger pockets was just like you was, know they published yeah, it. They published it, and we like I you know because I've been going down that path for my next book. Yeah, are you, what are you? Hint. Yeah, what are you, you what are you hearing? Are you hearing anything? Is that well? Like, I was gonna so I self published Wealthy Way because yep. I was like I don't care if you can. Yeah, yeah, I just yeah. want it out there, right? And um, I'm working on my second one. I will not say what it is, but uh, the mm. first draft is almost done. Oh, nice! And I was getting ready to just publish it again, and then somebody was like. Have you thought about trying to get an advance? Yeah, at a certain level, it's worth. Yeah. yeah, and I was like, dude, honestly, I don't really care. Like, I'm not. It's not worth it to try and go do throw all these hoops and they yeah. control everything and you know for fifty grand, hundred. Like that's yeah. what I thought in my mind. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they're like, dude, you're not talking like fifty to hundred grand. You could get a lot more. Yeah. And I was like, what do you think? They're like, I mean, we don't want to. You know, it's it, we have to go pitch, but they're like, you could see. 250 to 500 grand. Yeah. And I was like, all right. Yeah. Now we're talking. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right. Well, so t tell me more about yeah. this. <laughs> How do we do this? I had a buddy, he's not in real estate, but he's in the uh, kind of the, uh, kind of the, uh, the Christian world. Uh, but he's a New York times bestselling author multiple times. He's had a lot of books and he, me and him have been talking about writing a book for a couple of years now together. And who is it? Can you say, I guess I could say Jefferson Bethke. I have him on my okay. podcast. Okay. Yeah, he's the guy that wrote that. I had that viral video a few years ago. But we've been talking about that. And yeah, he we we're just the other day we we're having the conversation. He's like, dude, we could get an we, we could get a, a serious advance. And I was like, I mean, what are you thinking? Yeah, he's getting fifty thousand. He's like, no, you can get like real money at this because now we, at a certain level, yeah, you sold millions of books. You yeah, should be so, able to get a seven figure advance. Yeah, the the di the difference in the question is like. Can you do it if it's not in real, if I don't write a real estate book, uh, will they translate? Will they follow? I don't know. So if it's more of a, like a spiritual book or if it's a habit book or a goal, but you know, like, yeah, yeah. I don't know. So at the same time, like, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not in writing mode. I get in writing mode every few years and I'm How like, I'm not you there written? yet. Five, five in a journal. So yeah, yeah I think. So this will be my third. Yeah. I like, I love writing. I mean, uh, writing yeah. is, but here, here's the problem. I just read a book called The Name of the Wind. Have you read this? It's a fiction no. book called The Name of the Wind. It's super popular. It's got I don't know, like 50,000 five-star reviews. But some guy recommended it to me. He said, hey, it's one of the best fantasy books of all time. I don't read fantasy. I haven't read a fantasy no. book in a long yeah, time. Yeah, I haven't read it. I never do. But I read this book, The Name of the Wind. It was so beautifully written. It makes me never want to write another word. Because I'm like, I, it's, it's so, <laughs> I suck. I, I know, like, I'm so terrible. This is so good. And I'm like, and I know that's just a mindset thing. And so I know I'll get over it. But I'm just currently, I'm like, I can't it's put like in the work a, to write like good, that. You know, you're a good basketball player yeah. when you, you <laughs> saw LeBron. You're like, exactly. Oh, crap, you're, yeah. Dude. What am I doing? Like, what, <laughs> like amateur hour. Like this is, yeah. So maybe I'll get back in the book. I mean, books are, books are life changing. Books are, you're boiling down five, 10, 20 years of wisdom from somebody into one like thing you can consume for $20. Like books are life changing. So I want to keep writing them because they help people uh, at scale, but it's a lot of work to write a book. It is. Yeah. It is a lot of work. Yeah. So 
Yeah, it's just interesting because, you know, to go back to the history, because I, I do want to tell people what I think they should do today. But and I've kind of been saying some things, but the way I'm shifting my business is very different and I've never done it before. So I'm going to keep leaving them on the cliffhanger. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, after I started flipping 2015, um, I literally only did that for years. I'm just like, dude, I don't give a crap about rentals. Like I'm just trying to stack cash yep. and get skills. And to me, it was like, well, dude, I could buy rentals at any point if I know how to find deals, yep. raise capital yep. and fix them up. There's no difference. It's yep. just, I keep it instead of sell it. And yep. so, you know, I just like honed my skills. And then I finally started to keep some in 2017 and 2018. And 2018 was the first year that like, I felt like the market started to like really explode. Yep. Um, and it was like, man, we had some crazy appreciation in Vegas. Um, and it was nuts. Yeah. And then, you know, we kind of ran through that in 2018, 2019 was like a little flat. And then right before COVID 2020, like things were about to skyrocket. And then as we all know, people were like, oh crap, I don't know what we're going to do. Yeah. Yeah. That was that was insane. The run up that we have over the last four years. I feel I almost feel bad for people who got into real estate in the last four years. Cause like they all the false expectations. False expectations of what like thing is. Yeah. It's like it it it's not like this. This is not real estate. This was fantasy land for four years, especially flippers. Like, yeah. Uh, like every flipper I know is like, I just made another 180 grand. And I'm like, where'd you get the deal? MLS. I'm like, how like <laughs> no, like what are we doing here? Like, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's not that's not the game. And so they they they're not good enough. People who who build businesses in times of uh, prosperity, yeah, uh, their muscles are atrophied or never built to begin with. Why do you think Tesla is so good? You know, he started building that thing in uh -huh. like oh yeah nine yeah all the best. I mean, what there's a stat I'm I'm gonna butcher it, but it's Amazon, something like same thing. Yeah, it's like seventy percent of all the Fortune five hundred companies were built in recessions or something like that, or eighty percent. It's like vast majority of them were built in recessions. Why? Because they had to get good. Yeah, and that's where I think we're at right now. Is like there's no room for mediocrity in real estate anymore. Like yeah. either you're either you're great or you're out. Yeah. And there's there's no other option. And so you, you have a choice. You can you can choose to level up your skill set right now, choose to hone your uh, hone your skills and and become the world's best at something or go get out of the, go get into something else that's easier. Because <laughs> yeah. real estate's not for the weak at heart right now. Yeah. It's funny now that you're saying that like great businesses are forged in a recession. Yeah. You know, I became an adult in 2000, uh, well, seven, 2007 is when I turned 18, but yeah, 2008, I went to college and you know, that's obviously when everything dropped and I got to go through college, like, dude, I don't know how we're going to like pay the the rent and, you know, trying to play baseball yeah. and all this stuff. And, you know, like I was saying, when I was a realtor in 2010, just dealing with that, like it was so hard and, you know, I'll go on stage uh, like I spoke at an event in Dallas and I was like, it was a predominant real turn loan officer event. I go, how many guys have been in this business for over 10 years? Like very few. Yeah. And I go, okay, how many guys think this business is like, it's pretty hard right now with things going on. Everybody raised their hand. I go, okay, let me give you a perspective of what hard actually is. And then I start talking about oh nine and 10. Yeah. I'm like, imagine this is what's happening. <laughs> okay. You guys are complaining because you know, your rates are a little bit higher and you know, you got to actually work to get a buyer yep. to do something. And yeah, it's, yeah. But guess what? I would have had to sell four or five of these to get your one. Yep. But what's that great quote? You say it around the internet all the time. It's like hard times make strong men, strong men make like safe times and safe times make weak men. Mm. And it's like this great, like idea that when, yeah, when things are really hard, it makes, it makes good, strong people. Yeah. Uh, but then those people make things really nice. So when we look at 07, made us strong investors. Oh, eight, nine. Like we became stronger investors because of it, which led to 15, you know, 2015, 16, 17, 18, which made things really nice, yeah, just yeah. level and good. And that led to weak practices and poor behavior and not being good at your business. You just made money, which led to a lot of the mess over the last few years. And now we're getting into, we have a lot of weak people yeah. and that we're going to see a lot of um, blood in the streets over the next couple of years, I think, because people weren't good enough, but then that's going to make better investors. We're yeah, going to learn the cycle. The cycle just, continues. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, speaking of that, right. You know, obviously 2020 to 2022 things just went bonkers. And then, you know, we've had this kind of reset here the last 12 months. Um, 
And, you know, obviously there's still a ton of uncertainty of what's going to happen here. Yeah. Right. I mean, people are going to say, well, you know, rates have got to come down here at some point. Others will say, well, you know, it's election year. It's always good. What do you think? Oof. I mean, I, and, and also too, yeah. let me, let me preface and say, you're in a different stage of your investing journey sure. where you're now managing a massive fund. Yeah. And that's like your main business and strategy and everything. I kind of do a little bit of everything in real estate. So I'm looking at it from a very opportunistic and I know you're kind of looking at it in just one way. Yeah. But what do you see? I mean, I, I think 2024, I don't see, I mean, I, I, first of all, I don't see rates dropping anytime soon. I don't, I don't, I, who knows, right? My crystal ball has been broken for a little while, so I'm not sure, but I, I think <laughs> everyone's, ball. Yeah, yeah, nobody has that. I don't see rates dropping because if they do, and even if, even if they do, then People are going to just put their house on the market and a bunch of people are going to want to buy them. Like it just, it's, it, there's such a blockage right now. Like it's like, um, economic constipation, we'll call it yeah. like nothing's happening. Cause everyone's waiting. It's all just like getting festering in our society right now. And so if rates suddenly dropped, like it just r prices aren't going down. Yeah. I don't see rates dropping cause I don't see inflation. They're going to keep, they're going to keep rates high to combat the inflation that the government caused. Yeah. Um, we didn't cause the inflation. They caused the inflation by printing all the money and then they're going to make us pay for it by having high interest rates. Um, so I think we're going to have just a, a, a defensive year. I'm calling it a defensive year. Uh, I think there are offensive years where we're like, go, go all out. And I think like 2024 is going to be defensive years where we get better. That's what 2023 we, has been too. Yeah. Yeah. It really has been. Yeah. It's like, we gotta, we gotta get better. We gotta hold back a little bit. Like I'm reducing my like goals for the year a little bit. I'm always been like every year I want to grow by like 50%. I'm always like, go bigger, go bigger. When it comes to my real estate specifically, I'm like, let's, let's, play safe, a little bit safer right now. We need better debt. So when we buy things, we're getting like 50% loan to value. We're doing 50% down on some deals, 60% well, uh, loan to. to value. Yeah. You, you kind of have to from, 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 <laughs> you can't get the, the deal done. Yeah. Yeah. They don't, they don't work otherwise. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I just, I want, I want to be safer. And so I, I would trade right now. I would trade more safety and security uh, for slower growth. And I think that's just the season that we're in. Now, when it comes to other business stuff, like I'm going all in on things like the Better Life Tribe, even though it's a charity, but it's yep. or sort of a charity. Uh, we give all profits away to charity, but I'm going all in on that. I think now's a good time for that. I think now's a good time for a few other things that I'm working on. I got a mortgage company where I'm starting right now. Why? Because I think this is the best time in the world to start a mortgage company because it's the hardest time. Off. Everyone's falling off and it's the hardest time to start a mortgage company in the history of the man mankind. It's, it's just what you said. The it's, best company I, yes, start in the... That's what I'm doing. I'm like, what would be... What, what's like, the worst Yeah, what's the worst to start right exactly. now? Exactly. <laughs> I'm like, let's let's get good now. Yeah. So you remember baseball, right? You were a baseball yeah. player. Uh, I, what's it called? A donut? That big heavy thing you yeah, put yeah. on the end of your bat? So you're swinging the ba baseball bat with that big heavy donut at the end and it yep. feels super heavy. Then you step up to the plate, you take the donut off and now the bat feels like it's like one yeah, pound toothpick. Yeah. It's because your muscles got used to that heavier weight. So I want to use this year. I'm swinging with that donut. I'm putting four donuts on it in my bat and I'm just <laughs> swinging with a bunch of donuts. So that it's always called a donut. I'm yeah, not using it. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. A donut. Yeah. I'm really proud. I knew that term because I don't follow baseball yeah. <laughs> at all. I've so. heard someone bring up a donut in a long time. Oh, here we go. That's a good um, metaphor for life. Well, I hear donuts a lot, but not in that kind. <laughs> but no, no, it's, it's absolutely right. I, I tell people this too. It's like, I look at my life the last five years and I remember in 2018, um, that was like what I feel like was a culmination of everything I was building. And like, I felt like I really broke out. Yeah. And I'm sure you've had years like that where you're like, dude, like it finally just like all came together. Yeah. Um, but I remember reflecting on that year. I was like, wow, I can't believe how much more capacity I had mm -hmm. than what I thought you know, to, to, to do, I looked at the whole year and, and I was like, dude, I did this, this, yeah. this, that I was I, I can't believe I did all those things, you know, in the same amount of time I've always had. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. And now I look at where I'm at today and I'm like, wow, I cannot believe how much capacity I have yeah. today managing X, Y, Z, dealing with this fire, that fire, this thing, that thing. And you know, I don't know where I'll be five years from now, but that's like the concept of the donut is like, I don't think there's, there's a point where you have too much on your plate. Right. Yep. And so you start to feel overwhelmed, stress, et cetera. And so something gives either there truly is too much and you don't have that capacity and you need to get stuff off your plate or 
you keep filling your plate and all of a sudden your capacity expands and you're like, oh, all right. Like I yeah. can actually do a lot more than I thought. Yep. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a metaphor that, uh, my buddy, Jason Drees, who's my performance coach, he has used, um, and I like this idea of think of a balloon that you like inflate the balloon. And it's really hard because it's used to being small and you inflate the balloon bigger and bigger and stretching and stretching and stretching. And then if you leave that balloon at that size for a while, the balloon gets used to being that size. Now it's not a perfect metaphor because the balloons do shrink back down again, but <laughs> to some level it gets used to being that size. Maybe a better example would be your stomach, right? Yeah. You eat a lot of food, yeah. you just eat, 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 your stomach gets really big. And then even if you skip eating for a day, your stomach's still that size. Yeah. And so you have bigger capacity and, and it is a mental capacity more than it is tactical or anything else. Like you, your yeah, mind, it's, it's all mental. It's all mental. So your mind can tackle more things. And so over the years, if you're growing and that's why it requires going outside your comfort zone, it requires eating more food or blowing that balloon up bigger. But the majority of the world, they do not want, they don't like that stress or that discomfort. So they don't want to stretch their balloon. They don't want to stretch that, that at all. And so they're stuck in this mediocrity forever. Yeah. Uh, and they're never leveling up, leveling up their mindset or their business or their leadership because they refuse to get uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. They, they want to be the weak little rubber balloon. Yeah. 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 It's floppy. Doesn't even have any air in it. balloon. <laughs> yeah. That's going to be the name of your new book. Flaccid balloons. Flaccid I hope that's what you call it. It is. Hey, you don't want to be a flaccid balloon. You don't, you don't want to be flaccid ever. <laughs> We're going to avoid that. We're going to, we, we want, we want we strong, want girthy, yeah, strong, large, yeah, huge blood, blood flow, everything. <laughs> so uh, anyway, speak, speaking of that, speaking of that, you know, uh, of capacity and we're talking about body body <laughs> oh, good, i'm not okay. going to talk about certain body parts but i will say <laughs> I, i've increased my capacity um health wise for the first time really in like 12 years because i started to take my health seriously i was mm. like dude you know what i've been in good shape my whole life it's not like yeah. i had a problem i was like let's see what i'm truly capable of mm. and so i started taking my health to the next level you know three months ago i uh you know got a coach. Yep. I started getting on peptides. Yep. I got on TRT yep. and I've put on like 10 pounds in a very short amount of time. And I'm like, dang, dude, I didn't know I could like get this strong this quick. Yeah. I just went on TRT like three weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago. I have felt no difference. Did uh, How long did it take for you to feel anything different? Or did you ever feel anything different? Um, I definitely feel different for sure. Um, are you doing an injection or cream or what are you injection, doing? Injection. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's good. Yeah. Um, I do it because I feel super low energy a lot. Like throughout the day, I just, I'm pretty low energy a, a lot. Uh, unless I'm like literally on a podcast. Are you working out or anything? Yeah. I work out like five days a week at the gym. Okay, so you are. Yeah. Four to five at the gym usually. How much do you eat? I skip breakfast. Okay. Eat do you know how many calories you eat? I don't track it very well. I probably should. Do you have a guess? 2,500, 2,200. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So... I thought TRT would help. It hasn't yet, but I'm, I'm only two and a half weeks in. So, okay. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, you would feel it by now. So it also know. takes me like 12 beers to feel tipsy. So, I mean, maybe I'm like, yeah, I'm just a big dude. You're just a big dude. Well, yeah. And that's why I'm like, that's not very many calories yeah. for like how yeah. big you are. Yeah. Maybe I need more. I don't know, but yeah, but I, I eat more and then I just, I gain fat. So I don't know. It's a, it's well, a, I, you need more, more protein. I know. Yeah. yeah. That's what I need. I need that's cram, probably what you don't need enough. I need to cram a lot more protein. I, I'm probably 150 grams a day, which is a good amount, but it's not the 220 no, I good, probably need. That ain't a good amount. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's why <laughs> it's a good enough for average, like, like people who aren't Dude, trying you're to like six, muscle. four, like <laughs> and a half. <laughs> yeah. Well, how is 150 grams? Good. That's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I need more protein for sure. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm I have, on it. um, less carbs, I take like maybe. 200 a day. Do you? Yeah. Yeah. I'm one, I'm one ninety now. Yeah. Where are you getting your protein? from right now like what's your what's your like like what's that look like uh, okay. i struggle with getting that much yeah so i'll tell you guys what i'm doing now since i've started this journey um and also too i can recommend some peptides for you yeah, please. off camera so uh anyways i wake up at five and i eat a greek yogurt and a banana okay. every morning then i go work out i get it done right at well after my morning routine with prayer and everything so i work out at 6 30 to 7 30 after my workout I eat a bowl of hash browns, eggs, and steak. It's just a, a meal prep. Okay. Nine o'clock, I eat a protein shake. And that protein shake, I varied on what it is. Now I'm doing like 40 grams and half of it is like a uh, weight gain shake. So it's half protein, half weight gain. Okay. Pound that. 12 o'clock, I have another meal. So I'll have just uh, another meal prep. It's like 500 calories of like 40, 50 grams of protein, some rice, a veggie, whatever, right? Three o'clock, I have turkey, 
just literally deli meat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just eat it in the office. Is it stuff from Costco? They have the best turkey. I don't even know. My oh, assistant so buys it, so okay. I just crush it. You ever and, dip it in bitchin' sauce? You ever had bitchin' sauce? No. Dude. Is it like spicy? It's like, it's got some, it's got some kick to it. Not crazy, but bitchin' sauce. Oh, where do you it's get so it? so good. Uh, Whole Foods or I think Target might even carry it. Costco's got it. All right. I'll ask him about that. Anyway, give it a try. Yeah. And then I eat Filipino mangoes. Oh. Dried mangoes every day. Yeah. I love them. And then, yeah, for dinner, I have whatever like my wife gets. It's just, it's always going to have a lot of protein. It's yeah. going to just be rice and like, it's nothing. Yeah. I'm not doing anything crazy. And then yeah. at night, um, I'll either have an ice cream or a bowl of like whole grain cereal. Mm, yeah. That's basically it. That's all I eat every day. Makes some it's, sense. it's very frequent. Um, cause it is a lot of meals like thinking about it, it's like six meals a day. Yeah. But, uh, and the key is, is protein in every single one. Like I got every single that, like, one. Everything one. Yeah. That's where I like, I'll go like, like if I skip breakfast, which I've been doing the intermittent fasting for a little while now, and I really like that. Um, and I've done that before too. Yeah, have you? Yeah. I've done just literally two meals a day. Yep. And that was me. Um, like I felt fine, yep. but definitely like my weakest. It's, yeah. it's good. I think intermittent fasting is good for somebody trying to lose weight yep. because you're just going to skip a meal and yeah, like, you're going to lose. Yep. Yeah. I also think it's good for anyone who's like just on a lifestyle. Like, dude, I don't care. Like I'm just trying to like optimize for yeah. not having to eat six yeah. times. Yeah. Perfect. Um, but it's not good if like you actually are trying to, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> increase. Bulk, yeah. Bulk up yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I find that when I, do, when I don't eat, I have way more energy. Uh, it could just be, I'm, I'm more energetic in the mornings, but, uh, after I eat lunch, I'm just like tired from like one till five, yeah. six. And so like, I'm, I'm, I'm playing with that idea, but yeah, I think the key is I like that you have the Greek yogurt in the morning, low protein there, yep. the protein, then you got the breakfast with the steak and eggs. Yep. Um, yeah, I think that that, that alone would add 50 grams that'll, right yeah, there. That's like 50, that would, that's that would easily, add yeah. 50, 60 grams. That's yeah, what right you're missing. There. Yeah, it really is. And then for lunch, I always have, yeah, some kind of meat, dinner, some kind of meat. I went vegetarian for like six months and it was actually really- That sounds terrible. It, it was the best food <laughs> I've ever eaten. This is an interesting thing about vegetarianism is you can't just throw a steak in the on, on the stovetop and eat it. You have to actually make something when you're vegetarian to enjoy it. Yeah, that sounds so terrible too. the best meals, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the, the best meals I ever ate were like <laughs> as a vegetarian because I had to like get cookbooks and like do the work and like taste wise was amazing. But no, I got off that quick. You know, I went, <laughs> went back on to eating steak and chicken. And All right. So I now understand why your testosterone was low. Yeah, it, it might've been that way. Yeah, oh, for sure. I, yeah, yeah. Because like- Why you lack energy. Yep. Yeah, but that was like a year and a half, two years ago. But man, hey, it destroyed you permanently. It destroyed me forever. Yeah, <laughs> clear. we're gonna go with that, dude. Yeah, that's it's it's rough. So yeah, I am anti-vegan for yeah. sure. Oh yeah, I just started doing a thing called Legree. You ever done Legree? No, I've never heard of that. Legree. It like, like it's a like city. a it's a Pilates kind of a thing, <laughs> okay. but it's designed for people with bad backs because my back always sucks. And so like I've been doing that, and that it's nothing upper. It's all lower body, but it's super fun. If you ever get a chance to do a Legree, and by Legree. fun, it's that's the wrong word. It's painful and miserable. Okay, on your actually legs. now. Okay, now that you're bringing this up, yeah. you just because you were like, yeah, I work out five times a day. And now you're telling me you do Legree. No. So I, I want to yeah, know what you actually yeah, yeah. do. Okay, so tell I me do about Legree for lower body because it's great for lower body without hurting your back. Then it's I do the Pilates. gym for up. You don't uh, do any weights. It's there is weights. There's weights because you're on a machine that uses your weight. So there's, yeah, you don't have that. weights. No. Okay, so I do that three times. So a week. then three times a week I do that, and then okay. three, two to three times a week I'll actually do upper body at the gym. Gym. But what do you do? Uh, like the typical stuff: bench. Uh, I don't know, rows. Okay. Uh, I mean the, the, do the you do high list. reps or low reps? Lower reps. Like how many? Three to five, probably. Okay. All right. So you're uh, lifting heavy weights. Sometimes I like to do the what is the reverse pyramid or whatever. We like do like yeah, yeah. a whole yeah, a whole lot and then go You'll, down from there. Yeah. I like that idea to like do like two of like really heavy and then do five and then yep. do seven or whatever. I've done that for a little while. I did the keno body thing for a while. Yeah, I was team. gonna say, did you get that from Greg? I did, I got that from Greg. Yeah. Uh I, I like that plan. It was a good plan, yeah. but I get bored from planning. I need to get him gym. on the podcast. You I've, should get I've, him on the podcast. I've he's connected a good with one. him. Uh, yeah, he's he's a good, great marketer. He is a he's a brilliant marketer. But no, so I'll tell you, that's actually where I learned intermittent fasting from and yeah, reverse, yeah, yeah. you know because yeah, he's, he's real big on that too yeah, yeah he does five by five yeah um yeah no that what i think his workout is great for and intermittent fast for is like i i believe what he's got is the easiest way to like stay in shape yeah like dude three days a week freaking yep. don't eat breakfast just five by five workout three of them you're good yep because that's all he does it's like monday five by five chest five by five rows five yeah. by five squats we're good. That said, here's a, there's an interesting thing. Hormozy brought this up the other day. I saw somebody else bring it up. It's a, it's a great, 
line or, or, or topic. And it, it's basically the things that people did to get them to where they are. Like for example, in let's say it's a real estate or fitness, right? So what Hormozy did to get in his shape, what Greg did to get in his shape is probably not what they're doing to maintain their shape, no. right? But then all these gurus out there are teaching what they are doing currently now, doing. currently doing, not what they did. So like Hormozy was making fun of like morning routines. He's like, he's like, all these people are like, oh, just do this 17 part morning routine and, and, you know, do your visualization and do all this. He's like, that's because these billionaires are bored to death. So they just add all these weird routines in their life. <laughs> and now they're saying that that's what will make you successful. No, what made him successful was working 80 hours a week for 10 years, but that doesn't sell. And so it's easier to be like, you use this 15 part miracle morning routine. And I love the miracle morning idea, but like, yeah. it's, uh, that's not necessarily what makes you suc successful. It's work. Right? Yeah. Like, so actually. Um, I disagree with Hormozy on that because obviously I've done a morning routine for a very long time Me too. and ever since doing it, that's when I've started to have major success. Yeah. I agree um, too. Yeah. So, but here's the thing, like people mistake that for being all they need to do. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. well, dude, I did my, I got morning. early. Like I'm good. Like I've, I've won the day. Yeah. And then that's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the win. Like, so that's where I think people you woke miss. up. Good job. Yeah. yeah you you did it. You know, I woke up early. I, you know, did my thing and yeah. yeah, I don't really need to go to the office. Like I'm, I've, I've accomplished something. Yeah. So yeah, that's where I think they mess up. But I actually was talking to somebody about this yesterday and I'm going to make a reel on it. Cause I think it's super important for people to know, but like when I say, Hey, like I've never worked weekends. Hey, like I've always left the office by five, even when I wasn't making a lot of money, it is true. So it's not like yeah. I worked 80 hours a week to reach this level. Sure. But here's the thing. I work 24 seven. It's just, I choose what I'm working on differently. So when I say that, Hey, I'm going to go do a morning routine, super important to me because yeah, like time with God's super important to me. And so that is work. It's not like just this thing that like that's work. Yeah. And then when I go to work out right after that, guess what? My health is work. We just talked about how much work I got to do to eat all this food. Yeah to grow, you yeah. know, to the next level. Then I, the reason I leave at five is because guess what? I got to go work at my marriage and my kids and spend time with them. And so, you know, yeah. I'm working 24 seven and then, you know, I got to make sure I go to sleep at the right time. So I have energy so I can wake up the next morning and work yeah. really hard at all these things. But the thing that people don't understand is that everything I just named can't like, there's no substitute for it. You cannot substitute anyone in your place to go have your relationship with God. Yeah. Okay. You can't substitute anyone to go have the relationship with your spouse, unless you're a weirdo, <laughs> right? Like you can't substitute the relationship with your kids. Yeah. Like it's just time. It's just you. Yeah. You can't substitute your health. You're yeah. the only one who can make your body. I love the line. What you can't you, outsource your pushups. Yeah. You cannot yeah. outsource any of those three things. <laughs> yep. You want to know what the one thing you can actually delegate and outsource? Your business, your business, yeah. your work, yeah. your work, 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 as people would define it. Yeah. So we have this misconception that, oh, dude, I got to put 80 hours here and then everything else must suffer. Yep. When the reverse is true, that stuff can never yeah. suffer. This thing needs to be figured out how to be more efficient because this is the easiest one to outsource. Yep. I could work zero hours here and make a ton of money. That's impossible at the other ones. Yep. In fact, I love that idea too of like, I mean, you, you probably heard the analogy of the, about if you have a jar and you were to pour in, you know, uh, well, I'll tell the whole story. You have a jar and then there was a professor at a college has this jar in front of him and he's, he takes a bunch of rocks and he puts rocks in from the bottom of the top and he says, hey, is this jar full? And all the kids say in the class say, yeah. He goes, okay. Then he takes a bunch of pebbles and he pours in pebbles and it fills in around the rocks. He's like, and everyone's like, ah, okay. Yeah. It wasn't full. Now is it full? And everyone says, yes. He's like, okay. He takes out sand and he pours sand in there yeah. and it fills in around there. And everyone's like, ah, okay, now it's full. And he goes, are you sure it's full? And they're like, yeah, it's full. And he takes water and he pours it in. It fills in around the sand, right? And and the the metaphor being the rocks, those large rocks are the most important things in your life. If you fill up the most important, if you fill in your sand and water first, which is like your business, your work, like work, work, yeah. you won't have time to fit in your family and your fitness and your health. Yeah. But when you prioritize the large rocks first, it's like yep. family time, vacation time gets scheduled, time yep. with the kids. I don't work after five. I don't work on Tuesdays, whatever the thing is. Yeah. Now you have to, you have to 
because of the constraints, fill in everything else around it. And the magic is you do. Yeah. And that's what people don't realize is like, you will fit it in. It's Parkinson's law. Work expands to fill the time allotted yeah. for it. And so, yeah, schedule the big things, your family, your time with God, your time at the gym. Yeah. And then fit, work will fit in other places. Well, and this is the whole point. So it's like, we're all saying the same thing. So what I'm saying is the same thing or Mosey is saying. It's yeah. the same thing that um, whoever else was saying. It's just what we define for our rocks is completely different. Yes. Because for Alex, he doesn't have kids. Doesn't have kids, yeah. He doesn't care about faith. Yep. And so he's basically, and you know, his spouse works with him. Yeah. So like for him, it's like my rock is business. Because I already have business and spouse together. So it's just like all yeah. business. Yeah. He just fills up with sand. That's it. That's yep. his rock. Yep. You don't, you don't, <laughs> it is what it is. Yep. You know, I guess he's got health too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, that's it. Those are the three. And then he's good. And so when he's given his perspective, why would I need a morning routine? You're right. Like, if you don't care about faith, if you don't have to yep. worry about kids, like, yep. sure, go straight to work because you're like, you're going, that, that's the only work you can do. Yeah. There's nothing else. And that's why you have to be so careful about it. Like, I love Hormozzi. I love him, but you have to be so careful about who you get advice from, yeah. right? Because everyone's got a different perspective. Even me, even you, right? Like yeah. don't take what we say and go do it to your life because it works for us. It might not work for somebody else. And so uh, being discerning in that and not just taking like, you know, I, yeah, this guy says to do this. So I'm going to go do my morning routine. It's like, well, why? Like, what is it? What, but what I, I do agree with Hormozzi that making your bed is dumb. <laughs> I, I, I see no benefit to making dude i made my bed this morning for the first time in <laughs> years you know why because my wife is not here right now but my wife is flying and she's on an airplane right now he made it for her so she gets in today i want her to be like oh wow he made his bed well, like that was the actually, only reason why i do i'm glad you brought that up because the last time i made my bed i i used to make my bed every day but it was for that reason so my wife used to be a teacher yep and before we had kids and so she would she'd actually wake up before me believe it or not my wife like outworked me, you know, those times. And so she would wake up super early, go to school and I would wake up after her. And I literally didn't have a job or anything. I was just like, <laughs> I'm a real estate guy. Like, when do I got to wake up? This I obviously wasn't doing the miracle morning back then. And, um, she would like early on in our marriage, she, she like, let me know one day. She's like, you need to make the bed. Like, I hate coming home to this dirty bed. Like that. You just leave like crap. And I was like, really like making the bed and you know as if anyone's married you know like it does not need any justification for <laughs> why you think it makes sense or not you just do it you know the irony is that made beds are actually dirtier than uh, than unkempt ones because when you make a bed and you like do it all tight down there the bacteria and stuff in there grows <laughs> this is true they've done these studies on this and the bacteria and all the filth grows under your blanket and so you are more likely to get sick and have a disgusting bed. So next time your wife says, make the bed, be like, no, honey, I care too much about you to do that. <laughs> well, thankfully for me, I've never made the bed since we had kids because yep. now she stays home and she yep. wakes up much later than me. Yep. And so I'm out. Yeah. She can make the bed if she wants to make the bed. And she does. She makes and the bed because she wants too. it. And yep. that's cool. But yeah, I forgot that I, I used to make the bed. That that's reminded funny. me. Yeah. Yeah. The bed thing, you know, I, I get the... I mean, there's a book, make your bed. It's like, Hey, if you, <laughs> that's you, a book. That's a book. Yeah. It's by some Admiral guy who wrote it, had a viral video go <laughs> out about bed. make a bed. Yeah. Make your bed. It's like do the one thing every morning, like gets you started with a win, gets you in a positive mindset. Bro, making my bed is not a win. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I felt like I lost every day. I made the bed. Yeah. Like, day, oh, what am I doing here? Have you seen that guy on TikTok and Instagram who does the, like, um, the ironing of his bed and he makes his whole entire, uh, <laughs> no, yeah, that's... dude, his whole entire account is like, he's like that one guy from, uh, American uh what's that oh jace uh, bateman is that his name jason bateman is it hit not the character not the actor what's the movie american psycho oh, okay uh christian bale christian bale it's like he's got this, this vibe because he's like making his bed perfectly and he irons the whole bed <laughs> the and he, yeah he, he like <laughs> sets his dude you gotta look this up later he sets his pillows perfectly and then he goes and does like these like one arm push-ups he's the most in shape guy you'll ever see oh. and like but it's it's gnarly but these videos every one of his videos just gets millions and millions of views because the guy is just perfect yeah and there's like this sound that goes with it, like dude, that's like funny. oh it's I good gotta, yeah i'll show you this thing afterwards it's so good dude that cracks me up. that cracks me up <laughs> yeah make your bed <laughs> but uh yeah back to real estate so i uh i get what you're doing so you're, you're going defensive and yeah. well not even defense just safe yeah we're still gonna buy 100 million at least of real estate but yeah you know i'm just trying to you're not one of these and, and this is the problem that you know, people say it's like, oh, well, it's going to be tough. So I need to just go off the sidelines. Yep. Like I just 
you know, can't do anything. You're like, yeah. no, like say for me, it's just buying only a hundred million. Yeah. Yeah. It's I'm like, I'm not going to go for like 500 million yep. this year. And if I could, if I could, what are the, I mean, what are the constraints that anybody has in a business, right? It's either money, it's mindset. Like you don't think big enough. You don't have the money for it. You can't ha- manage it. People uh, like the people, the whole management of it, uh, or their like, uh, or marketing, like leads. opportunities, opportunities. Yeah, that's it. That's the only four. Yeah. The only four things that can stop you. So right now, our bottleneck, our constraint, is the ability to raise capital and the ability to harder find deals. Yep. yep, it's harder to raise capital than ever before because when you can go get six percent in a checking account, and who wants to invest in a real estate deal at eight percent? Whatever. Yep. Um, People do, but it's just, it's harder uh, and it's harder to find deals at cash flow. So knowing the constraints exist, we're going to try to fight through them all we can, but at, I'm also at what being point realistic. do you look at it and you say, you know what? 80, 20 rule. Like it's not worth the effort. Like we've accumulated a great portfolio. Yeah. Let's just chill on that and focus our energy on something else. It's, it's a good question. Um, I don't work for me. You know, if I work for my team, right? So like, I don't need more wealth. I don't need more money necessarily. Uh, so in my head, I'm like, I'm working for the team. So if I were to lay off, I would let down. Well, I'm not saying you wouldn't right. lay them off. Like you still have your portfolio. Uh, yeah, if, I guess. Um, but if we weren't growing, I just think if you're not growing, you're dying. Yeah. Right. So like, yeah, I could shift people to another thing, but at, at heart, I'm still a real estate nerd and I love it. Whether or not. Well, I'm not even yeah. saying you got to give up real estate. I'm just like, is there a better thing? Yeah. You know, because like, you know, when you first started your fund, yep. you were strictly mobile home parks. Correct. And then, then we added apartments, then you shifted and you self-storage. said, Hey, we're going to do this. We're I think it's very likely within a year, we will add in, um, a private equity component. What into I would businesses. into businesses, what I would love to do. I mean, Cardone's doing it. Um, a lot of guys are doing it. Homozy does it right. What I would love to try. And I'm not, I'm not for sure on this, but I love the idea is we buy 80% real estate in a fund and 20% business in that fund. Because business is some big diversification. Yeah, that's huge. cash flow. And it's cash flow, right? That's the cash so flow. the cash flow we're not getting from real estate, mm-hmm. we can compensate with business. So if I can buy Bro, I like that. Isn't that cool? I might steal that. Yeah, try it. Uh I, I love the concept because now. It, let's say worst case, the business went to zero. Yeah. It's only 20% of the fund. It's not the whole fund. We sell the real estate long-term this business is definitely more risky. It's more risky, but if we buy the right businesses and maybe in the beginning, maybe it's 5% of the fund or 10% of the fund, but maybe it's just, we're starting out, we're buying a, we're buy a $5 million, whatever, some company, especially one like that. Maybe I can personally help with, you know, like if I buy a mortgage company, yeah, like that's something I can, it. yeah, I can scale it a little bit. It, it, if I could buy a company at five X or three X, their annual profits. Yeah. Right. That's a 30% cash on cash return. Yeah. That will blend the 2% we're getting from real estate or 0% on real estate, which is no cash flow right now. Yeah. And I think, I think there's something magic there. Yeah. The downside of course is taking your eye off the ball. You do too many things and you, you know, try to catch two rabbits. You'll catch neither it is a, is a ancient proverb. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, well, you would so. need you need a team. Well, but yeah, people, people, but you, you would just need two different divisions, yep. right? Like yep. the capital raising division is still the same. Yep. But you'd have two things. Yeah. Pri- yeah. You have private equity side and you have a, uh, that said, when I got in the mobile home parks, I didn't go raise money for my first mobile home park per se. I went and found one person, actually Mindy Jensen from bigger pockets. I yep. grabbed Mindy. I grabbed Ryan Murdoch, who was a friend of mine that we had just met. He brought the deal to me. And then I brought me the three of us bought a mobile home park with our money. Yeah. We saw it. We made mistakes. We learned what happened. And then we tried a small mobile home park at 3 million bucks. We raised a little bit of money. We bought that. We made mistakes. We made some money. We learned. I want to do the same thing this way. I want to buy a business this year with my own money. Yep. And then figure out maybe a couple other small people. Like we just, you know, if I had five buddies, like we just put in a hundred grand, we take half a million, we go out and buy a $4 million company. Let's go try it out. And then we'll raise capital for it once I'm confident that I have the right yeah, team in place. So for that's, sure. that's, that's where we're headed with open door capital. I like that. Yeah. We'll no, see. I think that's a great idea. Um, and what I can say is people for me, I'm, I'm down the same path anyway. Cause I, yep. I love business more than I love real estate. Yeah. <laughs> um, real estate to me is just a business. Yep. So, um, with us, people have always been like, dude, why you guys run so many events? Like that's a lot of work and everything. I'm like, you don't realize the opportunities that come from the events every quarter. Yeah. Like I get business deals, investors, yeah, if people buy my stuff, that's that's awesome. Like, obviously, I want that too. But the people that I meet that lead to other opportunities is massive. And so, like, that's one of the big reasons Cardone does it too. And it's why we create social media content because you just are generating opportunities. Yeah. Um, but as you know, like in person, you know, that just different things happen. So 
yeah, I mean, for me, beyond just like the business side of things and buying businesses and starting new ones and everything, uh, on the real estate side, what I see is similar to you. I think that rates stay the same. I don't see 2024 like popping off. I don't see it declining. I just think it's yeah, just, it's just going to stay what it is. I mean, for a while. It's weird. It might just do what real estate's always done. It might appreciate 2%. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you know, like, welcome to a normal yeah. real estate market. Um, and so with that being said, you know, we're doing a ton of, you know, for the last year, creative stuff. So we've been doing novations and wholesales and I've been um, scaling back from flips. And so the majority of our deals this year for the last 12 months have been novation and wholesale. Um because we lost a bunch on bad flips and yeah. it sucks and it is what it is. You can't really predict that the yeah. you know rates were going to double and flippers were the ones who got hurt the most on it. Yep. It is what it is. Um, got to take the good with the bad. But my plan now this year or this year and going into next year is that we're going all in on this new program I launched called our partner program. And you know, it's at Wealthy Investor. It's amazing because I think it's the best way to get started. And I think it's going to be an amazing way for us on the house flipping side to get massive deal flow. Yeah. So essentially what it is, is we're taking people who have never, you know, really done real estate. And, you know, it, as you know, it's intimidating to get into real estate on your own. And there's a lot to it, right? Finding deals, talking to sellers, managing contractors, raising money, all those things. And we teach them, but there's this set of people that are like, dude, I just really need someone to help me out, right? Like it's the whole concept of maybe somebody interning for you or whatever. Like, dude, I just want to like, I'm not even here to really make money. I just need to see it and yep. be a part of it and experience it. And we've done that to a degree, you know, over the years, but never at scale. And finally, it just clicked for me one day. I was like, dude, I know what the next move is. Like, I know what the next shift and pivot is. In, like if I've built this massive community and all these students and I know marketing and I know how to create these things, why not merge the two together? Mm. And so basically with this program, it's our cheapest program ever. And with it, we give them AI software that already identifies the sellers. They're able to contact them, call them, text them, all that stuff. So they, they have the tool that they need. And that's all they need to do. Instead of having to go figure out how to negotiate a subject yeah. to deal, how to <laughs> get a price and low ball and whatever, just generate the lead and pass it off. That's cool. And my team here will just close them. And so we're closing deals nationwide now. And in the first, so we, I did like a challenge to launch it. And, you know, in that challenge, we had about 200 people join and we just finished the first week last week. This is week number two right now on Friday. And I think we've locked up five or six oh, in two cool. weeks. Now, will all close? No. Like yeah. there's going to be, it remains to be seen nationwide sure. what our fallout rate will be. But I'm already like, okay, I mean, that's the first week. Like yeah. they don't even have a pipeline built up yet. Like once they build a pipeline up, all these, you know, it's going to be crazy. And so like any deal that we get, we do a profit split with the person that's cool. who got the deal. So think about like what a way to start in this business. Yeah, You don't have to do any of the hard work. You just generate a lead. Yep. It's kind of like being a bird dog, yeah. essentially, but at scale. I love that. Yeah, um, I like the way you're thinking on that for sure. Is like, how do we, how do we, who not how this and get a lot of people and make it a win, win, win for everybody. It's a super win. And yeah. then, you know, you do a couple of deals with us. I don't need you to do deals with me forever. Yeah. Like get your confidence up, makes a little bit of money. Freaking. All right. Now go and do your yeah. own. Smart. Go, go get a hundred percent of the profit. So yeah, for us, I'm like, I don't know how big it's going to be, but like, dude, if we get, at scale. Okay. Let's just say I, my, my plan in the next quarter is to add a thousand people into this program. Yeah. So if we have a thousand people in there, how many deals a month are we going to get? I don't know, dude. But like, if we get, I don't know, 50, Yeah. which is easy, like to me, it should be very easy to do. But if you get 50 or a hundred, what That's does wild. that end up making a yeah. month? And guess what? On my house flipping side, the cost of uh, marketing is zero. Yeah. That's genius. What are you doing with all the, are you, are you mostly flipping them? No, no. Wholesaling, wholesaling mainly. Wholesaling, okay. Wholesaling, novations, creative, yeah. um, just cause they're all nationwide. So it's like, yeah, you know, so, yeah. um, That's and, cool. and, and we have like the, also like the, uh, education and the, the coaching and the community to sell the deals to our yeah, student. Yeah. Like, yeah. So this new guy wins, we win. 
a student wins because yep. they have a deal like dude it's going to be crazy that's it cool. already is being crazy so Congrats that's my that, that's my whole plan for 2024 i love it i love it i think it's it's brilliant we did a thing with, with apartment complexes we call it bring brandon to deal.com okay and it was like i'll pay you 100 grand if you give me a lead that we close on an apartment or a mobile home park it was mobile home parks to begin with and uh I think we did one. I think we had one person actually well, do it. That's a hard like it's it, yeah, that's what we learned is like, oh, this is this is a much harder buying hundred plus unit parks was tough. Uh, people that are able to generate those leads, they're keeping would, them. They're keeping them. Yeah. So it didn't really work out work out the way I wanted to. <laughs> yeah, I think we paid out one, maybe two. Yeah. Uh, it was a cool, it was a good thing to try because it gave some people, people learn. Yeah, people learn and got confidence. Yeah. Well, the thing with this that I already realized too was like, okay, everyone doing it is so green. Yeah. Um, I was like, crap, dude. You know what? Cause originally we we're going to just do like two calls a week. Um, you know, group code, like just, Hey, yep. this is how you need to approach it. You know, just, we're not teaching you anything about raising capital or yeah. constr I don't want you to worry about any of that. Just generate lead flow yep. and deals. Um, but what I soon realized was it's not even really about coaching and teaching. Cause like, it's very simple to learn yeah. <laughs> what we're trying to do. So like, all right, this is what we're doing. Okay. It's more about like at this point running them like a team yep. and like, guys, all right, you know what? We're just going to have a call every day now because you need to be accountable yep. to making your calls and doing Cause as you know, like a new person, their biggest problem is yeah. they just don't Not sticking with it. And yeah. They're just like, ah, oh, yeah, I'm busy. Yeah. I'm busy. Yeah. So that's, I'm, I'm just running it like a freaking, um, I don't even know what you would say. Like a boiler room, no. <laughs> boiler room, a massive team, like guys yeah. show up. I mean, that's what you do on, on heavy sales. Like when we're, when we're doing like heavy fundraising, like we've got like eight, nine, 10 people on, on calls all day. We do calls every single morning. We rev, we, you know, get everyone pumped up, get everyone accountable to the numbers they got to be hitting. Like how many people are you dialing? And we have this 80,000, something like that accredited investors on our email list. So like, what, what is your process when you don't have a deal? They're still just dialing, just trying to generate curiosity. We always have a deal. Okay. In five years, we've never not, we've never not been raising for a deal. Okay. Um, and that's a matter of, as you know, largely, and this may change, but deal finding is largely a dial you can turn up and down, right? You just spend more marketing, you go and make more, you know, like yeah, yeah. make more offers. Like there's, we can, we're, we tell our acquisition team what we want and they generally go out and just find it. Um, that obviously has been getting a little harder this year. Yeah. Uh, but generally we've always been raising money. And even this year we've always been in some, either in a raise or just about to do a raise or just finished a raise. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and because of that, people's money's not sitting either. I don't like to raise money if I don't have a deal. Uh, I've done it a few times where we're like, Hey, we're going to go out and buy a bunch of stuff. But like right now we're doing a fund, uh, fund 10 and we've got, five properties I, like in the fund, but we already have them all under contract set to close over the next three months. Like they're all lined up or doing due diligence. And so now I'm raising and now I can actually say, look, these are the parks. Here's a property. Here's a picture. And that's way easier to raise. It's really yeah. hard to raise for deals that you're like, it's trust blind. me. Yeah. Blind raises are blind funds are hard. Very hard. Uh, we've done them and yeah, they're tough. So yeah. I'd rather just have deals and it gets a little wonky sometimes with like, like you had to raise just the right amount and then one deal falls, uh, falls out and then you're like, well, crap, now I raised too much. I got to tell people that, sorry, you're not in. Yeah. Or, or you yeah. can't raise enough and you're under the gun. Exactly. Then yeah, all that happens and it's, it's constant. <laughs> it's, it's constant pressure, but that's what I don't like about freaking the fun. Oh, I know it's, it's a lot because like, you're always under the gun. Yeah. Always dude. Always. Under all right. We gun. got the property under contract. Yep start now no, go go yeah it's uh, it, it, it really is that way and that what we've had to learn and this applies to, to newbies that are buying their first deal too is like if you if you run your business in these like what's urgent right now so let's just say you're like i gotta go find a deal so all your effort is in deal finding then you're like okay now i got the deal now i'm gonna go get loans i'm gonna go talk to 10 different banks and then you get that and then you're like okay now i gotta get due diligence. You do that. Then I got to get contractors. Then I got to rehab it. Then I got to sell it. And you're at the end, you're like, okay, I got to start all the way over again at the beginning. Right. And that's what all of us do at the beginning of our careers. We have yeah. to do that because we're the only person. But once you build up machines that just systems and process that run all the time. So I'm always looking for deals. I'm always figuring out money. I'm always dealing with contractors. Life gets way more simple. And that's where uh, there's a phrase I say often is sometimes the easiest way out is up. And what I mean by that is like the easiest way out of your business and out of working 40 hours a week or 50 hours a week, the easiest way is often up means elevating, getting a bigger business mm. uh, because then you can have those systems, processes, and people that will get you to the point where you're not always just rushing to the next thing. And that's yeah. what Opener Capital did is we just got, 
we got, we're always raising, we're always buying, yeah. we're always selling, we're always closing, we're always refinancing. And they're just systems that run. Yeah. But it takes, it takes size and growth to be able to do that. Yeah. yeah. I love it, dude. Well, I think it's amazing um, just to see and for the people listening to or watching to hear, you know, like, hey, guess what? Like, number one, the market doesn't matter. Yeah. Like, your strategy just yeah. matters. Yep. And two, like, yeah, your strategy is probably going to change maybe even on a year to year basis. Mm -hmm. Like, once you're good, though. Yep. You know, it's not like... you. You know, you've never done anything, and all of a sudden you're like, "Oh crap, dude!" Brandon now says, "I got to put fifty percent down <laughs> to do a deal." I'm screwed. It's like, yep. no, dude. Like, no. Yeah, it's you, just you, you can flip, you yeah. can wholesale. And this is why sub two is taking off so much. Like, why yeah. Pace is having so much success over sub two is like sub two works right now. We're in the oh yeah, perfect storm. Yeah, we're in a perfect storm where sub two is a thing that works. I still don't love it as a. Uh, what, what do you thought? I mean, like, I don't, I don't love it, but what do you think? Um, love it like long-term? Uh, yeah. I mean, like as a strategy, I don't do it I, in my mind. I, I could be totally wrong because I don't know the industry that much, but uh, sub two and some of that stuff, I just get, I get worried about the seller still. I mean, the loans in their name. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I know there's a million things of like, oh yeah, you can, you know, banks aren't calling notes to do all that. I still, I get nervous about the seller. They're still yeah. holding that note. It's still in their name. Yeah. I mean, I, I have truthful. So, I mean, I have sub twos that I've had for years. Yeah. Um, I've also had sub twos where the seller went bankrupt and we had to liquidate mm. and you know it's just like it's kind of out of your control yep. so like yep. you know the pro is well dang yeah that'd be the only way to go get a three percent loan yeah, right now yeah the, the con is yeah i mean but you're not truly in control yep because something can happen yeah. underlying yeah you can control the asset of when you want to sell it and stuff but like something can still happen to that yeah. that's out of your control it's so. just messy right yeah and and but, but desperate it's like times, any, desperate measures. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but it's also like any business. It's yep. like, yeah. I mean, you want to flip a house? Yeah. This is, the, <laughs> this is what can happen. This yeah. is also, you know, there's, there's all these. So it's, I don't look at it any different than flipping or wholesaling because people are always like, man, well, what if I'm a realtor and I wholesale? Isn't my liability higher? And I'm like, dude, risk is risk. Yeah. Just they're all, there's no what zero percent risk thing yeah. in life. Yeah. So I think it's fine. I think it's just, uh, dependent on what you're trying to do, right? Like if you're trying to buy rental properties and, you know, like get cash flow, yeah, it might be the only way. Yeah. But one of the big problems that people run into is that, you know, when you're buying sub two with no equity, mm -hmm. then there's pros and cons because it's like, if, especially too, if you're overpaying for it, because some yep. people will buy one and overpay. Yep. And so it's like, all right, well, I always just look at deals in totality. I'm like, all right, can I, if I, you're telling me I could take over this loan and, and buy this house for a thousand dollars down. All right. Like it's very low risk for me. Yep. But you know, okay, I got to go put 30 grand down and you know, now I'm going to be negative 30 grand. And my only hope is that, you know, it, it may or may not cash flow, and over the next five to 10 years, then it'll turn out. Okay. Not a big fan of that. Yeah. Um, because once again, I like buying for appreciation. So it, it just kind of all depends where you're at. Now, I do like locking up sub twos and wholesaling them mm. because there are people that are like, oh, dude, I'll buy that all day. Yeah. Because that will, that's kind of what will happen is like, okay, we got a sub two, we put a thousand bucks down, and now I have a decision. Do I want to keep that? Yeah. Or is there some guy, and I don't even want to say some sucker. It's just like, that's what they want. Yep. All right, you'll pay me 40 grand for this and you're going to, you know, that you're going to be, you know, paying 40 grand over market value. All right. Okay. You understand the risk of a sub two, whatever yeah. I, I'll take the 40. That's just my thought. Yeah. Yeah. I go, I go back and forth a bit, but I mean, Hey, if, if you're good at it, there's way, the reason I, the reason I get nervous is fear is caused by, uh, I know not fear is the right word, but we'll go fear is caused by un, uh, lack of knowledge. Yeah. Right. You're afraid of driving until you know how to drive and you're not afraid of driving. I don't know sub two. Yeah. So I don't teach sub two. And that's why I don't do sub two because I don't know it. If you want to get in a sub two, go learn it, get the knowledge and then do it the correct way. Well, one thing we teach a wealthy investor is, you know, like all this creative stuff, like we teach it all yeah, the same stuff. And like one of the big things is innovations or net listings. And like, it goes by a lot of names and we've been doing that now for the last year. Very successful. Yeah, explain how that works. Basically, the easiest way to explain it is it is a net listing. And so right off the bat, most realtors will say, well, net listings are illegal. It's like, no, they're not. 
like in majority of places, they are legal. Now, your brokerage may not allow them, but they are legal. So, you know, essentially, like we would go to a seller and, you know, present them multiple options. So let's say their house is worth 400 grand and, um, you know, they'll take, I don't know, 350. Now, that doesn't work as a flip because yep. by the time you get hard money and all this crap, you'll lose money. Yep. Um, they also don't want to do a sub two because they don't want the mortgage in their name. And so what do you do with this deal? Right. They also don't want to list with a realtor. So you're just like, all right, well, <laughs> what do I do? Well, that's where a novation or a net listing comes into play. You say, okay, you know what? You, you want 350. That's what you want to walk away with. All right. If I can get you 350, anything above that comes to us as profit. You're good with that. And they say, yes. All right, dope. We'll handle everything else. And and by the way, you're also good with us listing it. And you know, when we list it, it'll be public, obviously. But we'll handle the negotiations, the repairs, anything the buyers need, all the closing costs, the commissions. You don't have to do anything. Like you're going to get 350. And they're like, oh yeah, no, that'd be great. I don't want to do any of that stuff. Yeah. That stresses me out. We're like, perfect. So we sign a contract. We go list it for 400 or whatever the market value is. We get the buyer. We handle all the bull crap along the way. And then sure enough, we close, right? And then whatever, let's just say there was 25 grand in fees to go close this deal. The The seller got 350, you pay 25 grand in fees, you got 400 in price. So you made 25 grand on the novation. That makes sense. So for us, it's great because we made 25 grand. We didn't, it, it's, it's like a wholesale. You know, we didn't yep. actually ever own the property. We didn't have the risk or the liability of a flip. Yeah. Um, so it's a great strategy. I like it, man. Yeah. It's, it's just, stuff. most people don't know how to do it and they think it's illegal and it's just like, you think that, and I'll just, you know, I'll just keep making money. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what we're doing nationwide with the partners. Yeah. Like we're doing it nationwide. So by, Oh, I forgot. I should plug myself. So guys, if you want to be a partner with us, freaking wealthyinvestor.com, click the link below schedule, call the team, say, I want to be a partner and we'll get you in. I love it. But dude, it's always good seeing you, man. You too, man. Appreciate you coming into town. I'm excited to hang out with your crew today. Yeah, thank you for doing that. Yeah. It'll be a good time. We're going to drill you on how you've built a social media empire. Empire. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, we'll hang out and it's going to be a good time. So appreciate you, dude. And guys, we'll catch you on the next one. Peace. We grew from zero to 1,300 employees in five and a half years. Most businesses suck at marketing, sales, and culture. You absolutely do not need to compete on price. You need to compete on the value and the experience.